by the power of Castle Hate Skull, I am Elamar Carly. Uh, thank you for coming to watch this episode. Okay. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope things are getting started off right for you and that you haven't failed your fitness challenges yet. You know, there's a lot of people coming in that first couple days of January, but then things trail off. I urge you to get on that fitness train, hit it hard, work off those cookies, stay consistent, 30 days, three times a day, a thousand calories a day, max, okay, intermittent fasting, keto, everything, do it all. Just kidding. Am I though? I actually like to take the month of January. If you have been working out less and eating like shit, try working out 30 days in a row, right? Overtrain yourself or risk it at least. Uh, I made a great transformation once doing work, lifting weights every single day, upper body, lower body, right? I think I hit like 28 out of whatever, 30, 31 days in January. Um, you can do big things in a month. If, if you can put in the time, if you can be consistent, if you can put it into overdrive for a shorter period of time, and maybe you're not, I'm not saying lift six or seven days a week forever for the whole year, but you can blast that for a month and you're not going to overwork yourself. It'll be tough, but you will achieve great results and kick off the year right, okay? And I'm gonna go into some workouts. If you don't have that much time, I, people will ask me about stuff that they can do if they have a short amount of time, some of the full body circuits that I do with people uh, that I've come up with for myself over the years that uh, I think other people seem to enjoy when they give it a try. So I'm gonna go into one of those later. For now, I want to, first off, last episode, I forgot to give credit to a friend of mine for the gift that he so generously gave me for Christmas. He gave me a workout, like thin hoodie, shirt hoodie, that said, kill him with thighness. Now, giving people gifts that are shirts that have like clever phrases or puns on them, it's a risky business. Because even though it might be funny, it's like, you're gonna really wear that, you know, it's like, I haven't had my morning coffee yet, or I'm with stupid, or whatever it is. It's like, Ugh, you know, these, Logos on your shirt can be just difficult, right? Did something I say offend you? Good. <clears throat> I'm not trying to do that, but the killing with thighness thing, if you know me, if you see me up close, despite people saying I don't work my legs, my thighs are actually gigantic, okay? Try to wrap your hands around them. I dare you, it's not gonna happen unless you're some sort of giant, which I know you're not because currently I have no giant subscribers to this podcast. That's a fact, Jack. You can see it on the YouTube analytics. So don't even come at me with an accusation that there are multiple giants watching this podcast. It's not true, and I'll see you in court. So my friend, whose name I shall not name because of what I'm about to tell you, give me that shirt. He's a super great guy, super smart. We played football together. We went to college together, uh, and... He was always, he actually helped me with diet. I remember he was, um, you know, he, he, he was really into working out, kind of one of, you know, there's certain archetypes of people when you're on a football team. Like some people just want to be told what to do. Some people are more into like, you know, taking on their training for, in the off season for themselves. So he was like me in that regard of, you know, understood diet, understood nutrition and wanted to learn more about it rather than just being, oh, this is what we have to do. I'll get the program from somebody else. I always wanted to, to see what I could come up with myself to make sure I was getting the most out of my off season. So he's a guy who's been in shape and been ripped. Recently, um, he was struggling with addiction. He was drinking a lot, doing other substances, and I know he worked out, but inevitably, it just, you're not working out as much, you're probably not working out as hard, your, your deficit's gonna be ruined if you are paying attention to diet, although drinking and doing drugs, I think has the tendency to make you have poor choices when it comes to diet, right? Less self-control, you know, you're drunk and give into those impulses to eat a greasy burger or fries or whatever you're feeling at that moment because it impairs your executive function. So it's all around just not ideal. And if you can get ripped while being an alcoholic, congratulations. I just don't know if I've met anybody that fits that exact criteria. Not to say that they don't exist. I think it's just a big hurdle for people. The guy who gave me that shirt recently got sober for a month, and I will tell you, seeing him uh, recently after that month, 
it's tremendous the difference that can be made from just 30 days of not drinking. The weight loss, the, the appearance in your face, uh, you're probably going to get more workouts in because you're not waking up hungover or feeling, even if you're not hungover, just the feeling of lethargy that you're probably going to get from having to process all that alcohol um, and the damage and stress to your organs that as somebody with a high tolerance, uh, you're going to have to consume more than the average person. So if I'm consuming a couple, two, three drinks to, to get a buzz and you have a much higher tolerance, you're consuming 10 a night or not counting, you have no idea how much you're drinking, that's going to be more stress on your organs. And I imagine that's more fatigue, even if you aren't feeling that per se in terms of a headache and I have to puke hangover. It's just, you know, your body's not going to pop up at 5 a.m. and want to go to the gym. And when I'm really hitting on all sudden, like if I'm working out hard and getting to bed, uh, uh, you know, early enough, you will wake up. It's amazing, you know, when you're sober and working out every day, your body can get into this rhythm where 5 a.m. may sound like early and hard to get up and wake yourself up. If you do that for a few days in a row, try it for like five days in a row. If you're not waking up on that sixth or that seventh day, like you're fully awake the moment you open your eyes, it's amazing, you know, and you realize like, well, I can't go back to bed now. I've slept fully. I woke up at five. And if I plan to work out, well, I guess it's either lay here awake and not even be tired or go get your workout in. Make it a habit. Put your clothes out. Make it a matter of getting out the door if you are able to work out in the morning. I think it's a great habit. And if you're able to not drink, even if you just, even if you just want to try it for a month, I encourage you to cut substances for a month and pay attention to a before and after pick and see what happens to your body because I guarantee you, you will see changes. And so shout out to my anonymous friend for making those changes and staying strong and taking accountability. And I think uh, when you make a commitment like that, you know, you'll just see, even within a month, how much it affects your life positively. Even if it's just a matter of self-confidence and looking at yourself and going, oh, I like the way I look now. That's gonna have a cascading effect to other things as well. Oh my God. <clears throat> so this turns into like Mark's AA podcast. Uh, but seriously, I just would encourage you in the new year, make that change. And if you can't commit to the whole year, right? Obviously that's a big thing. My new year's resolution is this thing the whole year. What about a month? We can all do a month. We can all get into a habit. If you're sedentary, start walking. If you're working out inconsistently, go every day or every weekday. Uh, up your game in some way, do the thing that you said you were going to do, try it out for a month. And the beauty is, if you think about that in the short term, that month is obviously not as long as a year and I think more digestible. What's going to happen after that is you'll have a habit, a positive habit, right? So even if you thought you couldn't make it to the month, by the time you make it through that month, you'll be on autopilot and it will be easier to continue the second month. But if you can Stop thinking in terms of these grand, oh my God, oh, for the next 10 years, I'm going to do this. You know, it's hard to say what's going to come up, but I, I guarantee everybody can do something for 30 days in a row. So try it out. Let me know what you pick and how you leveled up in the comments. I'm going to do a Bro Science Academy today. I'm going to start inserting these little workouts that I've done uh, over the years. You know, like I probably have mentioned before. When I was pressed for time, when I used to drive Uber and time is money and you have, you know, going, I'd be like, I have a half an hour to work out, right? I would uh, create these full body circuits that involved some sort of push, some sort of pull, some sort of hinge, some sort of squat, and some sort of ab movement. I would do these five or six days a week and the results were phenomenal. I was actually looking at some pictures uh, from myself when I was doing these workouts every day and I was like, damn, I need to get back to that. Just from an aesthetic point of view, because I, I got really lean, um, you know, I wasn't as big as I was now, but I think, you know, I don't need to be a certain size or anything like that, but just the vascularity and the condition that I was in and my work capacity, I could run, you know, a sub six minute mile. And it was just by doing all these movements back to back to back to back, my heart was just in incredible shape and it makes it easier to do cardio. It makes it, it makes normal workouts much easier. You have a higher capacity for doing more volume um, when you train your body in this high intensity fashion. And so, as I said, the basic template was five movements. Uh, and then I'd start off with a one mile run. 
this is important, and I'm going to talk about this later. I talked about it on the Stevie Weeby show, and somebody shit on it and said that's stupid. But, you know, it's sure, it's stupid to run a mile if you're uh, trying to be a bodybuilder or you're trying to be a power lifter or do something that, that you know, competitively where your strength is so important for that workout that you can't undermine it in any way. Sure, running a mile as fast as you can before a weight workout is going to make the weight workout more difficult. You can't use as much weight. Um, but it's not that important if that isn't your primary goal. The thing that I will say about putting the mile up front for these workouts as a general rule is you're not going to do it afterwards. If I thought I would do a mile as fast as I could after doing a full body weight workout that included lifting legs, then I would do that. But I found that anytime I left it to the end, I always talk myself out of it. And I'm realistic with myself. I, I, you know, For the most part, if I say I'm going to do something in my head, I will stick to that 95% of the time. But a lot of times things get left off. I won't train calves or biceps or something. I think, ah, fuck it. You know, I just don't want, <laughs> I don't care enough and I don't want that pain right now. And so running is one of those things. It, the other benefit is if you walk in to a gym, put a treadmill on a 2% incline and do a mile as fast as you can. And maybe you don't start there, but I started, let's say, at, you know, doing an eight or nine minute mile. And over the course of a few months, I would just drop that down by five seconds each time I ran that mile. So even though it might not have been as fast as I could at that moment when I first started, you're eventually reaching that threshold. We're doing a 555 mile on a treadmill at a 2% or 3% incline. Um, that was pushing it. And I remember thinking the entire time, like, my body feels like <laughs> every part of my body is like, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. It was like the red lights blinking at you. And then when you get off, you immediately have to shit your pants because your body thinks it's being chased by a bear. You know, when you just run a mile as fast as you can, it's a very taxing thing. But there is like a high that comes with it. You know, you're sweating, your heart rate's jacked up. Like, you could leave the gym after that moment. I spent six minutes running, less than six minutes running. And that was a workout in and of itself. So really, you know, you can condense a workout and to run as fast as you can for a mile every day and, you know, maybe do one resistance thing. But if you get that in, like, you got to work out, okay? You fucked yourself up. Um, you traumatized your body on that treadmill. Um, and you don't need that much. Just a few minutes, obviously. So I do that. I let my heart rate calm down a little bit and then go into these circuits. I'm going to outline one for you right now that I thought was a classic one. And again, some of these will get more creative and do things outside of those basic movements that I've had, but they're designed at the end of the day, whether it's you know four movements or six movements instead of five, they cover your whole body and emphasis on compound functional stuff. Not functional in the fake functional way where you're balancing on a BOSU ball with a kettlebell on top of your head, but like actual compound movements that mimic real life movements. So you know what a landmine is, right? A landmine press where like one end of a barbell is positioned into a holder. So you can kind of like do stuff like this, right? And it's on uh, a pivot point. So take that, load it up with plates, right? Whatever the weight's going to be. But all these circuits kind of have to have like one movement, you know, maybe something else you do isn't going to bring you to failure in the same rep range, but there has to be a weight that taxes you to failure on at least one thing, I'd say. And that usually was the pressing. So you'd get it right here in your shoulders, you're standing, and you start off with like kind of doing a shoulder press movement, right? Put a weight that, uh, you know, you're going to fail within five to 10 reps. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, and if you want to get a little bit more, you could also turn it into a push press. But at first, it's just more of a strict press. Now you're bracing your whole body. It's athletic because you're on your feet and generating power into your extremities from your base and your legs. So you do that each side, each side. Then you put it down on the floor and <clears throat> you stand beside it and you take that and do a one arm row, right? So you could bring it out here. You know, I would always fiddle with how I was standing in proximity to the bar for these rows, but you go from a pressing into a pulling, which is the one arm row. You can also use uh, a strap. It's a little bit hard to, to hold on because you're holding on to the end of a barbell, which is thick. Uh, pull with your right side, pull with your left side. Then you do a lunging movement, right? So you, you hold on as you uh, split your stance and you hold it on the outside of the working leg, right? So you're holding on to the, to the uh, landmine and you do a certain number of squats, then you switch it up. So we got the, uh, sorry, the lunge is the squat movement. It, it's a quad emphasis, glute emphasis. And then next up, you're gonna do one leg Romanian deadlifts. 
where just like the lunge, you're gonna hold on to that barbell on the side of your working leg, uh, bend over at the waist, so your hip hinging, that's really the movement, and balancing with your back foot up in the air. You work one leg at a time. And then the ab movement is you take this, I don't even know what to call these, but I just think of it as making a semicircle. You get, you grab the bar at the end with both hands, you take it from one side, arc it up in the air and bring it to the other. You'll notice it's a tremendous workout for your abs and obliques to stabilize yourself and generate force uh, from that bottom position to lift it up over your head. You will feel a tremendous tension in your core and I love that movement. So you do all those five, you rest a couple minutes, I'm gonna say two, then you do it again. Then you rest again for two minutes, then you do it again. That plus the mile that you ran at the beginning is a full body workout that's gonna have your heart rate up the whole time. It's gonna get tremendous cardio and you will feel fucked up afterwards and it'll take less than 30 minutes. So try it out. That's my Bro Science Academy lunch break workout for the day, okay? Let me know how it goes. You can also use a kettlebell for this, right? All that same thing, right? If you, have, if you just have a kettlebell at home, try that same sequence with the presses, with the rows, with the one leg RDL, with the lunge, uh, and you could also mimic this movement where you start it on one side and just get it up in the air and come down and then reverse. Five to each side or more. Sound good? Just do it. All right, today on This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Gyms, we're looking at a guy who is clearly just out of his depth, ego lifting with a weight he shouldn't be able uh, to even get under. If he has any good friends or anybody advising him, they would say, dude, you are not ready for this weight. And it just goes to show you, there are serious consequences. I know we laugh at this segment, but you know you can get under a bar sometimes that you are not ready for, and there can be dire consequences. So let's run the tape here. He comes down, he's struggling, he's struggling. And then he almost has it and his entire body collapses. It's just one of the most devastating injuries I've ever seen in the fitness space. His entire skeleton seems to just melt right under the bar. And that's what can happen when you try to lift too heavy. Doctors are warning you, lifting is dangerous, okay? Uh, uh, you know, it, it, there can be serious life-changing or life-ending injuries. I would be surprised if he ever uh, walked again after that. I'd, I'd be surprised, frankly, if he if he took a breath after that because his entire body crumpled under the weight. And it doesn't look like too much, but clearly it was too much for him. And uh, if you don't build up the tendon and bone strength over time, it's possible he was abusing anabolic steroids and his muscles were able to control the weight to some degree. But when the stress and tension became too much for his joints and bones to handle, uh, his entire body just collapsed into uh, a fat heap. And that's what we're seeing there. It's, it's disturbing, it's disgusting, but let it serve as a warning to you that lifting isn't all about getting buff and the glamour and the girls and the podcasts and the cool hair. Sometimes you might end up on the floor uh, looking like somebody stripped off a fat suit and left it there to be cleaned up because that's what we're watching. And I don't know how we got that video. It looks like he's alone. And I, just, I, I hope and pray that his family is dealing with this tragic loss <clears throat> as best as they can. Uh, if there's a GoFundMe, we'll put that up. I just... You hate to see it, but I hope the young people out there watching this take note and don't ever do squats. Okay, for Hella Chef Harley today, I have one recipe and then one general recommendation. The general recommendation I'm going to tell you because people don't seem to know about this is you can order food from Costco and have it delivered. Oh my God, this is one of the most worthwhile things uh, well, specifically having a Costco membership, right? What is it, like 60 bucks a year? You can get high quality meat, vegetables, all the basics, super cheap potatoes and fruit and all these things uh, delivered to your doorstep, right? So one of the big pain in the asses of going to Costco is the fact that you have to drive there. They're not always super close, right? It's always like the trek. It's like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to spend like at least you know 90 minutes between the drive, between the buying, between the loading, it is kind of this 
hassle that even though I love shopping at Costco because this is really the key, in my opinion, to sticking to your diet is filling your house with the right foods, the healthy foods that you have enough of. So you're not running out suddenly. You're not constantly going to the store. Um, you have things in place to make these decisions that you have to make every day to stick to your diet even easier. You you reduce the load on your executive functions uh, so it's not a constant decision between this and that and should I eat healthy and should I not, you don't require as much discipline if you take the decision-making process out of it by having your cupboards stocked with foods that you already decided that you want to stick to. Order them in bulk, have lots of them around, have meat in your freezer, have uh, you know frozen veggies on hand so it doesn't become this thing where you look, I have nothing in here or the, the food's gone bad or there wasn't enough of it um, you know, or I don't have enough money to buy things in bulk because most grocery stores are pretty expensive. Now, there is a cost to the delivery, but I've found that like it's still, even with the, the slight markup, because they use, what is it, like Fresh Cart or what's, what's that? Deliveries? Instacart. Instacart. There we go. Instacart. They use Instacart to deliver your groceries. Um, shows up. In, it's actually pretty quick, too. It's like within like an hour. So uh, it'll show up. You leave a tip, and with the pricing, it's still like you're still, I think, getting a deal compared to going, you know, to Ralph's or Whole Foods or something like that. So I would just encourage you to look into that. I know the, the barrier to entry is like, oh, I got to get a membership. Well, you're going to save money in the long run. And having those bulk goods delivered to you, I just think, is one of the best ways to stick to the things that are going to help you achieve your fitness goals, whether that's a, a caloric surplus or a caloric deficit or just eating healthier in general. Um, great thing to do. The second thing I wanted to talk about that I'm going to talk about a recipe, but a general approach to cooking a certain item that I see a lot of people who are trying to eat healthy make egg whites. Um, I don't know where I picked this up from, but I started doing it. I started microwaving my egg whites and I like this a lot better because I always felt like egg whites in a pan are super messy. They're watery. They stick to the pan more. It just never quite cooked the same way that, you know, eggs with yolks in them cooked, right? Um, it, those tend to be more solid, less watery. Obviously, there's fat, and so it, it has a different consistency. And the just, like, you know, they tend to burn if they're just egg whites, and some of it will be cooked, and some of it will be undercooked. And there's just always, like, more liquidy and watery. And when you mix stuff with it, it, it makes smaller chunks compared to eggs. So what I started doing is making these, especially when I'm cutting, I'll make an egg white scramble with some of my favorite vegetables or, or the ones that I know I'm going to buy and eat and they taste good, um, specifically broccoli, onions, and mushrooms. So I just go to Ralph's because um, these are things that I'd buy like little, you know, little, uh, you could get them from Costco, but these are, I'd just buy the mushrooms sliced already, the onions sliced already, and it's just a matter of boop, boop, boop. Maybe you chop up the uh, broccoli a little bit. You saute them, um, you know, in an olive oil spray, no added calories, and you have a high volume of food that you cook in a pan, um, add a little salt, tastes great, and that's gonna serve as the base for your scramble. In the meantime, as you're cooking the vegetables in your pan, you are microwaving a carton of egg whites that you can get from Costco. So this is two cups uh, of egg whites, <clears throat> and it's probably the equivalent to like 50 grams of protein in one of these things. I mean, you could chug it too, put it in your protein shake, but I liked just, you know, it's one carton. They sell like six packs of them. And as far as egg whites go, this is the cheapest uh, egg white only, you know, pre-made uh, package that I've found. It's the cheapest out of, out of all those because they sell egg whites elsewhere. They can just be very expensive. These are very cheap and they come in, you know, uh, cartons that are six in each package. You put this in a bowl or like a you know, a plastic like mixing bowl, I think would be good. Maybe spray the sides so it doesn't stick at all. Um, put it on five minutes. Cook it for like two and a half, three minutes. Then you stir it up a little bit because it'll kind of make this like bunt cake shape where part of, you know, the, the middle doesn't get cooked, but the outer uh, perimeter gets cooked. So you stir it up a little bit just to get it to even. And it starts to look kind of fluffy, right? It makes this like mold, this egg white mold. You take it out. You chop it up into smaller pieces, and then you add it to the, the vegetables as they're cooking. That way, it's kind of like pieces of something. Because I think it's cool when you're like, you know, you're eating a scramble or a salad, and there's like pieces of meat. The way egg whites normally look in your pan is like 
tiny little pieces spread out. They're attached to the spinach. They're kind of like cooked onto the vegetables. It's weird. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I just don't like it compared to taking this out, dumping it in there, and then you have like bites that you can eat. You take a, a chunk of egg white and a chunk of vegetable and eat it together, and there's just something more satisfying with it. Um, add a little avocado, add a little bit of cheese, maybe low-fat cheese. Uh, a little goes a long way. And these scrambles end up being about, you know, if you use like a quarter cup, like a sprinkling um, of cheddar cheese and some avocado, it's still like 600-something calories. And when I eat a meal like this, it is so filling, you know, I almost can't finish it, especially when I'm in a deficit, maybe my stomach's a little bit smaller, but it's just an example of something where vegetables and egg whites uh, and a little natural fat like avocado, it goes such a long way that 600 calories really feels like you just ate a Chipotle bowl that was 1,200 calories, and you're sitting there like, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm filled, and that, fold up, and that's the name of the game when you're trying to get lean is filling yourself up and it's mostly protein, mostly fiber, you know, not very much fat, not very much additional carbohydrates outside the vegetables. Um, and then all of a sudden you're eating in a def deficit with a full stomach. Amazing, right? Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to eat in a deficit and have uh, their stomach totally full to the point that they're going to want to puke out all these egg whites in two seconds. But don't, okay? I do not encourage bulimia. I do not want you to eat a healthy meal and then throw it up just because that's going to accelerate you leaning out even more. Do not do it, okay? You made the decision to put that food in your stomach. Now deal with it. All right, so this week on Hella Sick Fitness Pages, I wanted to highlight a guy who I think is... <sighs> An amazing role model for athletes and lifters everywhere, both because of what he's been able to accomplish athletically, as far as his physique, being natural, uh, and the message and the energy that he delivers to people, I think is just something I could really endorse and say, this guy, you're going to get a kick out of him, Eric Bugenhagen. So this dude is a former Division I wrestler out of Wisconsin. Uh, I think he wrestled at like 191 or maybe even less than that, and or 197 or maybe a weight class below that, like 180s, um, 185. I forget what the exact college weight classes are. But cut down, really put himself through hell to make that weight class, and then when he was a senior or something, he decided to go up to heavyweight um, and talks about how, like, you know, just because this is a misunderstood thing that people will talk about athleticism, you know, and we kind of associate like, oh, being athletic, like being lean and ripped. And he's like, not really. You can punish yourself and cut down enough that you're so weak at that 185 that you're actually less athletic than a guy who's like 15 to 20 percent body fat, but is so much stronger. And, uh, you know, his body is able to, to recover and endure um harder bouts of exercise because he's not depleting himself so much. So that's always one of these like misnomers where people confuse like athleticism with being ripped. The two really don't have anything to do with each other. We will see athletes who are ripped, especially like in the UFC where you have to be in a weight class. So you're incentivized to sp strip off any additional body fat. But just as far as athletic performance, um, you know, you'll see these exemplary, amazing bodies in the NFL, but a lot of the guys, you know, carry 15% or more body fat because that's healthy. Uh, for athletic performance. So he's kind of a, a, you know, somebody who I've watched over the years. He's gotten, I think he's up to like 270 now. He's not super tall, but he's been bulking up naturally. He does like a gallon of milk every day. I don't know if he's still doing that, but that's one of these like old school bulking techniques. Um, I've watched him. Really what I'm drawn to him about is he's always like, experimenting. He's a, a former strength and conditioning coach for University of Wisconsin uh, for the wrestling team. Um, but he's somebody who seems to always be taking this approach of like, I'm trying this, I'm trying that, I'm working on my bench, I'm working on my deadlift, I'm working on these, you know, like a, a zerker squat, I'm working on uh, doing bands, I'll do bands in the morning and then over here and I'm trying, like, he always looks like he's working and experimenting with, with new things while really going hard and improving himself on the basics. So that's an approach that I can advocate because he's not coming at you like a guru, like I know everything, but he is somebody who's, uh, who does know his shit and is, is the proof is in the pudding because he can bench like 500 pounds. He can deadlift over 700 pounds. Um, 
and the videos of him doing that are super entertaining because he does it in his garage with a bunch of rock music and he posts shit like this. Let's play this one where he's screaming at the camera. Eric, your butt came off the bench. It doesn't count. Your 45 degree inclined bench press turned into a zero degree inclined bench press because your hips shot off the bench. I bench press 300 pounds in high school. I can qualify to tell you how to lift despite you lifting for 19 years. I also weigh 160 pounds. <laughs> Air right, race, you got <laughs> so that's a funny point to me because people will like, like when me and Brendan will post lifts and you know, Brendan will hit like 420 pounds. And be like, Your butt came off the bench and doesn't count. It's like, who the fuck are you? Like rarely is it somebody who's an actual power lifter with actual evidence of them doing lifts. And you know, somebody's always got something to say. So he's just gently mocking that, but it's like, yeah, dude, a lot of that shit doesn't matter unless you're in a powerlifting meet. And, you know, um, sure, it's not ideal form, but who gives a shit? You're pushing yourself and and lifting the heaviest weights you can while doing it safely. But coming off the bench is not actually a dangerous thing. If anything, it makes the, the direction that your shoulders are pressing a little bit safer by turning it into a slight decline. So... Um, I just think he has a positive mindset and will make videos like that where he's just like pumped up and making fun of, you know, in that instance, he's actually making fun of a hater. So uh, let's do this next clip where it's just him lifting and screaming for 34 seconds. And it's just fucking entertaining. And he is doing lifts that legitimately weren't that, like, you know, lifting up 400 pounds in a, in a Zerker deadlift, you know, basically resting in your biceps. That shit's crazy. 925 pound rack pull. He's just in his garage going nuts. And I love this energy because it's just him. It's just a man in a garage going nuts, filming himself. His wife is in the house probably going, what the fuck is going on? Um, but he's living the life and goes to show you that you can have this set up in your garage and a bunch of weights and a camera and still make incredible progress. Um, you don't need a gym. This guy's also uh, a WWF, uh, WWE like feeder program athlete. I'm not sure exactly where he performs, but he's a pro wrestler now. And I think it's cool because I do think he's natural. He claims to be natural and having watched his progression and that he's like legitimately bulking and putting himself in a big caloric surplus and lifting heavy as fuck weights all the time. Um, I don't think his progress is abnormal. He's just a really athletic guy who's committed to getting stronger by gaining weight, and some of that is fat. Um, it's cool to see dudes like that because the WWE is like, at some point in time, it's like yeah, every single dude's on steroids. If you had muscles, you're on steroids. I think it's cool that he can do that and achieve these great feats of strength without the use of anabolics, you know, because um, I think that's a, good, uh, that's a good role model for kids who think the only way to get strong or the only way to, you know, maybe you want to be a wrestler too, and you think that's the only way to do it. But in fact, it isn't. So I would follow this guy. His YouTube page is even better, and he, he will explain a lot of lifts. Um, he does have good form, <laughs> despite him doing that video about people critiquing his form. He does have good form. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and just, again, unique in the fitness space, in the entertainment value that he provides while giving you legitimate information. Sound like someone you know? Mm -hmm. All right, for this week's Hater of the Week, another interesting little Hater of the Week because this guy, I don't think intentionally, was coming at me to hate. In fact, he said some very nice things to start off the conversation, but then I had to inform him, hey, I don't like your tone, buddy. And then we got into a philosophical conversation about the difference between rudeness and offensiveness. So he left a bunch of comments initially under uh, the Stevie Weeby podcast. So when I talked about the thing that I talked about this week, actually doing like circuits preceded by a mile run, one of his comments was, uh, never run a mile first, that is retarded. You ruin your heavy lifts, uh, always run and stretch after lifting or do just sprints. Now, before that, he said, Mark is such a genuine good guy from what I see. Um, it blows my mind people don't know everything about fitness and nutrition. It's first nature to me, I guess, because I've been into it since I was 14 years old. Okay. A little, uh, little cocky there, huh? He also said, what was Mark's max ever deadlift? This is on, on the Haters Will Say Pod uh, YouTube channel. He said, what was Mark's max ever deadlift? And at what body weight? I want to know if I'm stronger than him, LOL. 
And I answered it there. I said 495 by five at like 245 pounds. I'm not that strong and I don't really max out with dads because I have bulging disc issues. He messages me and I'll just read the, the start of this and then recap the kind of debate we had, which didn't get too unfriendly, but I'm somebody who likes to debate and I just wanted to showcase this because I don't need to be offended to start a debate or I don't need to be hurt, but I will debate with people when I feel like I'm right. And they're resisting that idea while being rude to me and accusing me of not knowing what I'm talking about when in fact it is they who don't know what they're talking about. He said, you seriously seem like the nicest dude on earth. The fact that you take everyone's questions about fitness and actually explain it and don't get annoyed is impressive. The patience you have is crazy. I have a problem where I get kind of annoyed that people don't know everything about fitness and nutrition. Well, I don't know everything about fitness and nutrition and I don't think you do either. Uh, your podcast with Steve was great. What was your best one rep max for deadlift ever? And what was your body weight? So this is where it starts. I said, thanks for listening, my man. And now I already answered this on my podcast page. So I'm answering a second time. I said, 495 by nine is my best dead. He goes, LOL, I asked one rep max in body weight. I just want to know if I'm pound for pound stronger than you, LOL. I always ask people their one rep max and they always tell me their reps. Like, why do fitness people always answer like that? I don't care about reps. All I care about is one rep max. My grandpa is James Lawler, by the way. First ever Mr. Muscle Beach, 1948. Big glass of who gives a fuck? So I say, you're rude. Do you know that? I'm sorry, LOL. I said, I actually answered you in depth on YouTube. He says, that's not my intention. Uh, I said, so look that up, you lazy fuck. <laughs> he says, oh, my bad. I asked if he's on the spectrum. We get into this discussion where he eventually, um, you know, said something. Huh, I guess I'm just a sarcastic asshole. And I said, what have you said that's been sarcastic? Because he wasn't being sarcastic. He was just being rude. I just don't find, this is his defense before I start. I just don't find it that rude. I'll, I'm absolutely insensitive. But I can see how other people can get offended by it. But honestly, it just makes me think they're being overly sensitive. I'll work on it. It's probably not a good trait to have. Legion of Skanks. I don't know why he put that in. But there's this idea, and sometimes I'll encounter this amongst young men, where, you know, in that instance, he started, I answered him for the second time, and his response was, oh my God, I don't know why fitness people just can't answer. I'm asking this really simple question. It's like his annoyance level, and when you're asking for information from me, and I give that to you, and... It's as accurate as I can provide you. And then your response to that is like to mock and condescend me. I just have to say, hey, that's rude. Then he jumps to, uh, yeah, I guess, well, if you're offended by it. Uh, you. But I make this distinction. I go, no, 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 I'm not offended by it. I'm just telling you for your own benefit and to draw a boundary here that when you talk to me like that, I'm not willing to engage in a polite conversation with you because I don't want to. Any goodwill that I had towards you is vanishing the moment you start to become rude to me or act like I'm somehow inconveniencing you by answering your questions. Now, we then have this debate about, because um, I'm like, I wasn't offended by it. He's like, well, rude and offensive is the same thing. And I said, no, it's under two, it's, you know, offensive behavior can be under the umbrella of rude behavior. There is some overlap between these two terms. They are synonyms perhaps, but they are not exactly equal to one another. Um, rudeness, I assert, is transgression of boundaries and norms, right? We have normal behavior, polite behavior, expected behavior. We follow a certain set of societal rules and to transgress them either deliberately or accidentally would be considered rude. Now, I don't need to take offense or have an emotional response to somebody being rude to me in order to recognize that the behavior is rude and to tell them that it is rude. And on the other hand, you don't need to do anything rude or out of line to offend somebody because somebody could be imagining your intentions uh, were different than they were. And even when you're following some sort of social protocol, somebody could still be offended because the offense taken is on the end of the recipient and in their head and in their mind and, and the, the emotional response that they get to some outside stimulus. So the two can have overlap. You can be rude and somebody can be offended by it. You could be rude and that could be offensive, but they're not the exact same thing. And I just wanted to have that conversation with them um, because guys get this idea that, you know, oh, well, you just can't handle me because I'm... Um, you know, oh, I'm sorry if I'm offensive, right? I'm sorry if I'm being edgy and you just are too emotional and sensitive. And my response to that is, no, 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 no. 
I'm not sensitive. You seem like a nice guy and you went out of your way to reach out to me and write me and, and praise me. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you watching the podcast, but I'm telling you this for your future benefit, because in case you're walking around interacting with other people like this, you might want to know that your behavior is a big turnoff to most people. And if you find yourself going, I, I don't know why I don't have any friends and nobody wants to talk to me. And after I have one conversation with them, well, everybody must just be too sensitive for me telling the truth all the time. And it's like, mm, it's not really that. It's that you come across like a young, cocky, rude person. And that's not pleasant for most people to interact with. But I don't need to have an emotional response to any of that to be like, you know, that's not okay to talk to somebody like that. Or if you want something out of me, if you want a response, you should be more polite. If you want something out of anyone and you're reaching out to them, there is a certain protocol. Um, and if you're not aware of those rules, and still breaking them, then I'm doing you a service by letting you know. But again, it has nothing to do with having a sort of emotion or being flustered, and that's what gets conflated today is the idea of like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, if you're pushing back at all, oh, am I just so offensive? Am I so offensive? I don't even know, like, if you can't offend me if you don't know me personally, because you don't have enough information about me to say something that really hurts. Everything that's publicly available information or something that you could get from my Instagram page you know, like you can't offend me by making fun of a picture that I put on my Instagram page, <laughs> um, you know, because you just, you need to be my mom or my good friend and say something that really digs and hurts based on intimate knowledge you have of me. If you're just being a dick online, I'll point it out, but don't think that it has some greater emotional impact on me. You're just being immature and showing that by doubling down on this idea that you're just somehow so edgy and know everything coupled with all those statements like, you know, well, I just know everything about fitness. I just forget sometimes how stupid people are. It's a general condescending attitude that I don't think is too uncommon for guys in their twenties. But if I meet a guy like this, who's being cocky and rude for no reason, guess what? I'm going to tell you. And when I ended the conversation with giving the Wikipedia uh, screenshots showing the exact definition of rudeness. Rudeness is a display of disrespect by not complying with the social norms or etiquette of a group or culture. Boom. Nothing to do with emotions or offense. Um, you know, but his logic is, well, because they're listed as synonyms, they're always interchangeable. And I said, well, if one word is a form of another word, then all forms um, of that word are also precisely equal by your logic. So for example, a uh, a hate crime is a form of um, rude behavior, right? So is all rudeness a hate crime? No, of course not. So that's your daily logic lesson. Isn't that fun when we think about words and stuff like that? You can be rude and you can be offensive, but the two aren't the same thing, okay? And if you think being offensive is cool for the sake of it, oh, you probably need to grow the fuck up. In this week's Hey That Hurts, oh, I posted another photo and I got some great responses asking people to say, what does this guy in the headshot do for a living? Gabriel Lamberth, who I actually did an ad or not a few weeks back, said, bro, you are so many things in this one. A young pastor for a Baptist megachurch in LA that only dates black women. <laughs> Father with two kids in art school who always votes Democrat. A Subaru owner. Literally every dude you see when you go to Tahoe. A high school field trip chaperone who has some has a sort of inappropriate relationship with the hottest girl in class. <laughs> a guy who really, who really made in through the 12-step program and never looked back. The hey, my name's Dave and I have hepatitis commercial guy. That one nice teacher that lets all his students pass no matter what. The guy that every freshly divorced middle-aged woman wants but never finds the accuracy. My friend Todd Dorms is a lumberjack who happily cuts down eco-friendly bamboo. Um, haters will say you only wear the Sherpa denim jacket with flannel when you watch Yellowstone. That may or may not be true. Childhood star who claims he's clean, says Chad and Mandy. Um, <clears throat> Logan Chitwood says Chuck E. Cheese door greeter. <laughs> Uh, AG says broke back Austin, my friend, but says broke back mountain revamp, but instead of a threesome with chicks, it's very generous of you to say that mm. <clears throat> is banging your dad while teaching your mom how to get the physique your dad secretly wants in the first place. Or maybe it's the other way around. Whatever doesn't matter. Dudes, chicks, this guy does it all. <clears throat> um, screams. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Let's build your dream home. Genghis Khan's food tester. Planking supervisor at Planet Fitness, head counselor at summer camp, 
Full house if you murdered the other cast members. <laughs> it's really dark and random. Haters will say you chase single moms, make them fall in love with you, then disappear. How did you find that out? Santa special elf that puts cocaine in his milk. A vegan activist. The new guy at the feed store. Looks like if the Pink Panther was an actual person. Haters will say he does, all he does is uh, the voiceover work for gay lines and animated shows. Okay, a little too close to home. This man is a Starbucks head barista. Okay. And watches Yellowstone once, Google's ranch jobs in Montana. Live in dog groomer for Lady Gaga. Life coach who lives with his girlfriend who pays all the bills. All right. Pretty good, huh? Pretty freaking good. Looking like Harry's stunt double on Harry and the Hendersons. Live action Lion King. Kevin Dillon and Fabio's love child. If one more person tells me I look like Kevin Dillon, God damn it, I'm going to freaking explode. <laughs> That's funny to you? This is funny to you? You think I look like that guy right there? You think I look like Kevin Dillon? The next person who says I look like Kevin Dillon to my face is getting slapped. I don't care if it's my own mom. Do not compare me to Kevin Dillon. I am not drama from Entourage. Don't get it twisted. I am my own person. If anything, I'm Matt Dillon. I appreciate you watching if this is the first episode you've ever watched and you just randomly saw me pop up like, what? What's this? Haters will say, Helen Mark Harley has a podcast. I was unaware because I've been living under a rock because I didn't even know that the buffest guy on Instagram had a fitness pod where he explains to other people how to potentially be the second buffest person on Instagram. If you put in the hard work and dedication and take steroids for 20 years, maybe you could catch up. It's possible. If you believe it, you can achieve it. Another thing you can do is follow me on Instagram if you're not doing this and you're discovering me, at Hella Mark Harley, where I will remind you all the time to watch Haters Will Say, and you can submit your questions to me on IG, and I will answer them on the show. And if you wanna come hate on me there too, and if you're clever enough or stupid enough, you'll get featured. Smash that notification bell wherever it is and make sure to be reminded every time my podcast drops.